Hello and welcome to another episode of the Live Cost Construction Experience. Delighted this week to be joined by Matthew Cutler-Welsh, whose mission it is to help people create better buildings by building better. I like that. So ever since mm-hmm. listening to his first podcast while well, running to work, he's wanted to create a podcast about living in a healthy and sustainable environment. Today, Matthew is the host of the Home Style Green Sustainable Design and Building Podcast. And Matthew, you're very welcome to the Live Cost Construction Experience. How are you? Thank you. I'm very well. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you. Excellent. Uh, I know you've done you, you've done a bit, bit of work down in uh, this part of the world, so it's kind of nice to to know that we're all connected. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're we're big. Uh, we're big zero uh, accounting software advocates here in Live Cost. So, yeah. Uh, a great New Zealand company. So uh, we do have a connection with uh, Zero and um, a lot of their customers. So there's definitely a connection there. Enough about us. Tell me about <laughs> yourself. How did you end up here? What's your background? We, we like to get in to understand the person behind the business a lot of time. How did yeah, you so, so I always um, I always start by telling people that I'm not an architect and I'm not a builder. Um, so, you know, the obvious question is who the hell am I? Um, I did a edu. I did went back and did an engineering degree after some time, um, wondering what I was going to do when I grew up. And um, at the time, I think what I was really looking for was sustainability engineering, but that didn't really exist as a, and it still doesn't really exist as a thing. It's not. It's not really a thing. So um, I did a course uh, in natural resources engineering, which talked a lot about um, water resources and. It taught me a lot about systems thinking, and I distinctly remember um, we had one assignment where we had to think about a system uh, of systems, and I chose a house because that um, is the obvious system of systems. And I got quite detailed about, I got quite interested in looking at how a house uh, should function as a complete system, but within that system, how all the individual systems um, would ideally work together to provide. The, the true function of a house, which is to look after people, shelter people, and keep them warm, dry, healthy. Uh, and we've known for a long time, it's been a um, dirty, open air secret, that mm. our houses simply don't do that in New Zealand, in Australia. And the more I looked at that, the more I realised it's not we're not necessarily that unique in this part of the world. The same sort of issues have occurred elsewhere and, and are ongoing. Yeah sadly all around the world really so um uh i worked as a as a graduate i worked in an engineering firm but then i got involved in some sta- sustainability projects looking at uh, retrofits of existing homes and um then i ended up doing uh working with the new zealand green building council and we uh, had a program which still still runs now called homestar which is the equivalent of green star for homes or or lead but it's a, a version of that that was created from the ground up specifically for New Zealand. So it was looking at it was a, an environmental rating tool for, for New Zealand homes. And uh, yeah, I've done a few bits and bits and pieces uh, since then. My, my day job at the moment is actually as an education manager with uh, ProClima here in New Zealand. Um, but in amongst all that, I started my the podcast Homestyle Green basically because I just wanted to talk to. Uh, cool architects and builders who are doing stuff in in the, the world of sustainability. So the, the, the idea of the podcast was more of a passion project, you know, didn't really have any plans Absolutely. to commercialize it. Yeah. <laughs> no. Interesting. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not that much of an um, entrepreneur, obviously. I thought I might have been, but uh, at least I haven't yet. Um, it's been a really good excuse to pick up the phone and uh, or or Skype and uh, Zoom to um, the most amazing architects. Uh, it's a great way of opening doors and starting conversations with, with amazing designers. Yeah, and the, the plan is to, to keep the podcast going? Yeah, so, so that's been going um, for, uh, well, eight years now, on and off. But um, since then, you know, podcasting has grown as a medium. And just in the last six months with people being um, not able to connect as much physically, uh, I think there's been an even bigger increase in, in people connecting online. Um, so I'm, I'm involved with the, the Passive House Accelerator uh, a little bit. We're, we're working on a, a Passive House podcast, which will be launching soon, which is really exciting because that um, it's a growing community 
around the world. And it's interesting how I think in some ways there's been more connectivity recently in some ways than previously. You know, I've re easy, we've realised that it's easy to reach out to people and have conversations with people um, on the other side of the world. And uh, I think people um, are really uh, are making use of that and um, are attracted to it. Absolutely. Tell us about the Passive House Accelerator. What is it and what will it do? So it was the brainchild of uh, Michael Ing Ingrie, um, who's an architect from, um, he's in America, and he's, he's a very experienced architect. He's been doing Passive House uh, designs for a while. Started out like a lot of people have to um, sometimes do it a little bit by stealth <laughs> because mm -hmm. clients don't necessarily know what it is or are a bit bit scared that it's going to blow out the costs or they're going to live in an airtight box or whatever it is. But of course they love it when they get the end product and then it, it grows from there. Um, so like a lot of people who get introduced to Passive House and then have their exper first experience with it, they want to share the the the, um, the knowledge and the experience and uh, yeah that's really the the genesis of of the accelerator is a separate um, it's a it's um, just a not for profit group really an organisation that's established in order to accelerate the growth of passive house and to encourage what tends to happen fairly naturally in that industry or that sector is the sharing of ideas mm. and we were reflecting on that um just last week actually just how open people are who are working uh, on passive house projects or with that mindset it's very very open to sharing details and you know, drawings and how they solved problems in, on a particular project and uh yeah it's very collegial uh type of environment and and the passive house accelerator just really enhances that so it's getting away from our traditional trade secret ideas that you know when, yeah, let's, it's definitely let's, let's, let's share yeah. our knowledge yeah and i don't know if it's just because it's a relatively small niche still it's you know quite a um it, it's definitely growing uh but it's a it's a small group of passionate people relatively um, or whether it's just the mentality that most people get into it because of some sort of greater good they they know that the way they have been doing things isn't isn't quite cutting it and passive houses presents a way to actually come back to that what is the purpose of a building and really provide buildings that are performing that function of looking after people properly and the okay, only so thing i've seen with, with with particularly with builders who end up um working on a passive house project is the sense of pride that they get once they finish it because suddenly they're being asked and measured on really high quality work and you can see that once they get to do that it kind of reignites a, a spark in them as to why they wanted to be a builder in the first place yeah i mean there is definitely that tell, tell me in your opinion what is a sustainable home so i spent a long time avoiding the word sustainability because it, it went it got a bit too trendy and, and I thought it was a little bit vague. Sustainability in some ways, I remember reading a book uh, by um, Bill, Bill McDowell uh, when I was uh, at engineering school, uh, The Cradle to Cradle. And it, it kind of hit me as like the concept, the whole concept of waste is a human construct. And in nature and ecosystems, there's no such thing as waste because everything, if it doesn't have dual purpose, then after its use, it gets recycled or reused to something else and just everything kind of works together. Uh, and in our design, very few things do that. We, we, we design things for a single purpose and then we have this sort of disposable uh, culture. Um, and I really like that. And the extrapolation of that cradle to cradle concept would be uh, the living building challenge, which the best illustration of that I've seen is that it goes beyond sustainability. I remember someone saying once that sustainable is really not that much of a, a target. If you were to describe anything else in life as sustainable, like the classic example would be if somebody said, oh, how's, how's your marriage or you know, how's your relationship? And you said, no, it's sustainable. <laughs> 
it'll be pretty rubbish. And, and in fact, if that's if pretty much anything else, if you know, how's your how's your business going? Oh, it's sustainable. It's kind of flatline. And achieving sustainability is basically saying you're doing less bad to get to there. It's sort of a an asymptotic curve. It just gets le- uh, you know it just sort of plateaus. Really, what we should be aiming for is beyond that. Is is buildings environments that are um that are beneficial to humans but also beneficial to the planet and that's the that's the um aim of the living building challenge which the the intention really is to make the environment the or the place better as a result of the building being there so the water that comes off that building is cleaner it might be producing energy. It's enhancing the environment rather than just doing less bad. So it's a bit of a long answer, but it's, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's quite a, it, it's such an important concept as people just sort of talk about sustainability without really any definition of it. The big question would be, and especially where we are here in Ireland and uh, in the UK as well, um, there's a lot of housing crisis going on and therefore there's a lot of panic. Like we need to build, we need to build quick. So mm. they're looking for the quickest, efficient, most efficient way to build homes to ease the crisis, I suppose. How economical is it to build green and build sustainable? Well, the, the classic answer is how economical is it not to, uh, in, depending on the time length that you look at. And this is, this is the classic uh, objection that you have when we start talking about things like passive house, people just assume um, with with a good degree of uh, reality that it's going to cost more and uh, if you look at the time scale of just design procurement building yeah it's probably there's, there's a premium there but if you include all the externalities which we should really include because if it's particularly if it's low cost housing if it's social housing there is a raft of other uh, ex- externalities and expenses that we all as taxpayers and, and parts of the community end up paying for and the most obvious one is health and that's very rarely put into the equation. you won't see health on the quantity survey spreadsheet but it's there it's a real cost we know that here in new zealand our winter mortality rate is um one of the worst in in the oecd you know, we have something like 1600 uh, 1800 um, additional deaths attributed to cold and flu, uh, respiratory disease uh, in the winter. And somebody was just commenting uh, to me yesterday that if that occurred, if you if we saw that sort of peak um, from from road uh, vehicle accidents every winter, roads would be shut down. We would be stamping on that straight away and, and figuring out what's causing this. We we can't have this type of um, this level of, of death and, and illness occurring every single year yet because it's sort of a silent um killer literally it, we, we put up with it um so cost is, is a tricky one the other thing uh with regards to passive house or any type of really energy efficient healthy good design it doesn't necessarily have to cost any more and if you start with a budget you can build to whatever standard you want. You might have to change, you might have to simplify the design, you might have to make it slightly smaller, but it's gonna um, perform so much better. Um, so the, the problem often occurs when people start with a, a standard building and then have to add things to it to make it perform in a certain way. Well, of course it's gonna add more cost because yeah. you're adding things to it but if you start with the end in mind and start with the with the actual budget then um you can build to that budget yeah uh, where are we then as an industry in terms of sustainability building passive like as a as an industry as a whole how do you think we are reacting to this i mean obviously if everyone believes there needs to be change how do you think and where how do you think we're doing and where do you think we are uh, it depends. It depends where we're talking about. Uh, it's there's some really exciting traction that's starting to happen. We're seeing municipalities in parts of certainly around Europe, um, also in parts of. Well, so let's look at Europe. We have some places where passive house or near passive house is, is basically mandated. Ireland's a uh, big example. Certainly parts of Germany, uh, Central Europe, where 
passive house is not really that big a deal because the building code is so close to it that no one really bats an eyelid. Um, we've got things like uh, Vancouver where there's um, the energy step code, which is a fantastic um, device because it basically gives really clear indication to the industry. This is where we're going in the next 5, 10, 15 years. So either come along with us or if you're any good at, at, at your business, then you probably want to be ahead of that curve. But having that really clear roadmap of this is where we're going is super important for the industry. Um, so Vancouver has been a, an amazing leader there. Um, down in Australia, they've overtaken us here in New Zealand. We had the first passive house was built in 2012 and it's been a, um, a curve since then. We've had a steady but good growth. Australia has overtaken New Zealand because now they've got um, more examples of um, apartment buildings, uh, commercial buildings, all uh, starting to hit that uh, standard. So we're seeing really good pockets of growth and it it's ripples in a pond. You know, it's once people see that stuff, uh, they feel it, they're just going to want to do it. They're going to want one. So it's, it's going to spread, um, dare I say, like a virus. <laughs> yeah, be careful um, with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but so I don't like to... I mean, I could get down saying, you know, it's, it's still a tiny, tiny part of the market, but yeah. it is growing. And I, um, I've seen some really positive things recently that, uh, that are really good signs of people actually getting it. How is, how are, how is our suppliers doing? I mean, obviously, to, to, to do this and to do it right and do it at scale, we need full buy-in from a product availability, innovation from product. How do you find suppliers to, like building material suppliers, uh, fair in terms of providing us with sustainable home? Uh, material so in New Zealand uh, we're a little island out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean miles and miles from anywhere so we're probably the worst case scenario when it comes to supply chain and procurement unless you happen to be one of the the, the um, incumbent uh, <laughs> companies that are here but again we're seeing um, really good growth in the availability of uh, suppliers from uh, inter international suppliers, but also local suppliers and local manufacturers um, adapting to what those trends that they're seeing. I'm cautious of the, the, the need for innovation in this space, particularly in places like New Zealand, where we are a little way behind the place, uh, places like Europe or even North America. I say that there, there's a place for innovation, but sometimes we just need to copy and, and catch up because a lot of the, there's really good thinking out there. There's amazing technology that's tried and tested. We can adapt that. We can, we can bring it in. We can import it literally, uh, uh, or we can adapt it and, uh, and create some of those, um, those products here. It, it can be a barrier. We, an, uh, an example would be aluminium uh, standard non-thermally broken window frames. We do have resistance from the industry here to, to change to thermally broken window frames or, or higher performance frames because they're quite comfortable, um, I guess, selling the products that they've, all, they've been supplying to the market for a few decades. And without any um, policy changes or, or requirements, then they've got little motivation to to change uh, what they supply to the market feels like it, it is a thing that it needs to come from from a top-down approach i mean when when these products start being specified um it becomes a different a different story doesn't it at, at, at some point at some point i think it does need to come to the top i've thought a bit about this uh with with another um organization the super home movement which uh originated from christchurch uh, just after the earthquakes down there which was a, a, the, the point of the super home movement is to just help everyday people bridge that gap between just a stock standard code compliant home and a, and a passive house. There's this quite big void in the middle and it's quite hard to navigate that. So the super home movement tries to sort of just hand, handheld um, people in that direction. And um, yeah, that big part of that is saying a lot of it's going to be ground up. We, 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 spreading the word, getting people, um, bringing people into homes so they can see and feel what a, a warm, dry house actually feels like to be in, particularly in the, in the middle of winter, it's great. 
uh, so that'll that'll have a slow sort of um, trickle effect from the from the bottom. I'm becoming more and more of the opinion that government will change when they are confident that their ideas will be seen as acceptable. So our job in the industry is to grow the number of people that are, are demanding it to make the politicians comfortable enough with making or, or feeling like they're making the decision when really the hard work's been done at the grassroots level for, for, for a decade or so prior to that. Yeah, you mean you, you touched on something there as well was the te- technology. I mean, what role will technology play in building sustainable homes? So I, I want to s- separate um, technology from innovation. Mm-hmm. And I think there is absolutely a place for technology. Stuff like this conversation uh, is just amazing. I remember when first using Skype when I was at, um, at university and just I think it was just the most amazing thing. We have the ability now to share so much information um, digitally. And we also have amazing um, BIM technology, uh, CAD. Uh, we've got CNC machines that can just you know copy and paste stuff, 3D printing. Amazing, amazing stuff. There's no technolo- technology barrier. If there might be a, um, it's still relationships. It still requires connection people to people. That can be done digitally uh, to an extent. Um, so I think there's absolutely a place for for technology to assist with that third leg of the the price, cost, quality, and bring all those together um, by using because we can have all those three together. Um, if we use technologies uh, in the right way. Brilliant. Matthew, there's a lot in there. You've given us a lot to think about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Where, where, first of all, where can people find out more about you and the projects that you're involved in? Yeah, so Homestyle Green is where I hang out, uh, homestylegreen.com. And on there, I've got links, but I definitely recommend people checking out the Super Home Movement. If they just search for Super Home uh, New Zealand, they'll, they'll find that. And of course, the Passive House Accelerator is a fantastic group of people. They have a weekly hangout, uh, happy hour, every Wednesday. Um, it's Thursday my time, but it's Wednesday in, in the States. Um, fantastic group of people, um, really great event. And particularly in this time, if, if you are, kind of um, locked down or, or constrained in your social network, it's a really great thing to um, get involved with the Passive House community. Yeah, brilliant. The world has certainly become a smaller place. There's absolutely no question about that. Matthew, we, we know, speaking on that subject, we know it's late down there, so we appreciate you uh, giving up your time to come on. And Pleasure. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Keep up the good work.